I'd like to welcome all of you here today, especially those of you who are joining us, not in person, but virtually. We're glad that you are part of this service as well. These are strange times to be saying goodbye to people that we love. Uh, I know it from my end as a pastor, having conducted way too many Zoom uh, memorial services by now, but it is still our love and our devotion that brings us here to this place today. And it is still God's presence that is with us as we gather in this place to honor and to remember a really good life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here this day to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate and remember the life of Alfred Earl McEwen. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God search our hearts that in pain we may find comfort, that in sorrow we may find hope, and that even in death we may find resurrection. For dying, Christ destroyed our death, and rising, Christ restores us to life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Alfred put on Christ, so now in Christ may he be clothed in glory. Here now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope purify themselves, even as Christ is pure. Let us pray. Oh God, you are there when we take our very first breath. And you're there when we breathe our last. And you are with us every hour, every day, and every year in between. We give you thanks for your faithfulness on our life's journey. You're always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and you know what we need even before we ask you. So we pray this day to, that you give to us now your grace, that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see again the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live. So that living or dying, our life may be in you. And nothing in life or in death will separate us from your love. We praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labors. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. And especially this day, do we praise you for your child, Alfred, whom you have graciously received unto yourself. To all of these, grant your peace. Let perpetual light shine upon them and help us so to believe where we have not seen, that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It was hard to pick him for Alfred service only because he loved so many. When Nicola and I were talking about the kinds of things he loved to sing, the kinds of music he loved to hear, he was definitely more uh, oriented to the classical repertoire of the hymnody of the church. He loved the, the Bach and the Handel as well as the spiritual tradition. He just loved it all. Um, and we're going to listen to, we don't get to sing unfortunately, one of the great hymns of the church that speaks about God's faithfulness to all us in all seasons. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness.
Thank you, Nicola. Nicola's had a long, full day here at the church, but that's not that unusual. I'm sure your dad had many long, full days when he was practicing at the choir or working on musicals and cantatas and things like that. And uh, Nicola had the privilege and honor of playing with your dad and for your dad for many years. And she came here, I guess your dad became a member here in 1998. Uh, but I don't know how much longer he was singing, and Nicola came here in 1999, so they had a long time together, and he continued to sing in the choir for many, many years. The scripture lessons for today come both from the First and Second Testaments, the first from Psalm 23, that familiar psalm people of God have turned to for centuries as a place of comfort and strength. If you know it, say it along. I'm going to be using the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup. And over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When Jesus was preparing to leave his disciples, they were no more ready to let him go than we are to let the people that we love go in our lives. And so he had these words of comfort and strength for them and for all of us. We need not fear death, that God is on this side of of life and God is on the other side as well waiting for us. Hear these words from the 14th chapter of John's gospel. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. I will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas, one of the 12, said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you in a little while. While the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. I've said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of these words this day. I want to thank Karen and Kirk for sharing memories of their father with me. I've only known your dad in the last chapter, the very last chapter of his life, I've been the pastor here, or one of them since 2014. And so I do have fond memories of him, but not the kind of depth of memories that you all have. So thank you for sharing so many parts of his life story with me. And I'm going to try to share some of that today. And then you're going to fill in with your own remembrances and have a time of some family sharing. After we listen to a song uh, that Alfred's going to sing to us, this is from a CD that he recorded back and he was 69 years old, which is pretty amazing, number one, and he sounds pretty good. Uh, so that's just, just remarkable. I'm so glad that can be part of our service. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get to you as well, Mark, all right? We're gonna try to zoom you in and we'll try to put a microphone so folks here can see, hear and listen to you as well. Alfred Earl McHugh was born on January 30th, 1929, the youngest of nine children to Julia Clay and Beverly Tolbert McEwen in Mobile, Alabama. He had six older brothers and two older sisters. His dad passed away when he was only 19 months old, so he was raised mostly by his mom and his older siblings with help from Big Mama and Big Daddy, who lived down the street. He 
grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and knew firsthand the realities of living in the segregated South. From early on, Alfred was smart, and he had a great sense of humor, along with a musical talent and a dramatic talent and a talent for being able to mimic other people's voices. Fred was telling me that during World War II, when stockings were hard to come by if you're white and impossible to come by if you're black, he would call up the local department store impersonating an older white woman to order a pair and say she would send her little colored boy to pick them up and then Alfred would go and pick them up for his mom. I love that story. I'm saddened by that story in lots of ways, but I love how subversive he was, how he played the system to be able to get his mom the stockings that she deserved, just like every other mom. His love of music and his musical talent were also evident from a young age. As a teenager, he was hired to sing at a local TV station, which wouldn't put him on camera because he was black. The problem was he became quite popular. He was really good. And with the young ladies, especially, who wanted to come down to see him, and it caused quite a stir when they actually did and realized what he looked like. After graduating high school, Alfred took his talents to Xavier University in New Orleans, where he majored in music and would go on to get his uh, graduate degree as well. And while he was there, he had a chance to sing with Duke Ellington's band when they came through town. And Duke was so impressed with Alfred that he offered to take him with him on the road right then and there. Alfred declined because he wanted to finish his degree, but Duke told him to look him up when he graduated. Uh, he was married for a brief time to his first wife, Faith Pinkney, who tragically died soon thereafter of a brain tumor when she was just 20 years old. And then he made his way up to Baltimore for an audition at WMAR. And it was during this time that he met and fell in love with a young widow by the name of Dolores Marguerite Johnson. She heard him sing and he won her over immediately, not surprising. They were married in June of 1952, which made Alfred a father to her young son, Billy. Alfred went off to OCS with the Air Force and was one of the only African-Americans in the barracks. His fellow trainees constantly stole his hat, so he would be hatless when inspection rolled around and get in trouble for it. But one of the guys, Mark Wright, befriended him, and they bought extra, several extra hats, which they would hide around in several places so Alfred could always be prepared whenever inspection came. That friendship, and that act of kindness left such a deep imprint on Alfred, so much so that he would name, later name his son, Mark, after his friend. Kirk told me that it was rough with a wife and a daughter living in their car just off base and Alfred going through regular hazing and some of the unwelcome behavior from the guys around him, but that all changed when he went to the colonel on the base, who discovered that Alfred could sing, I mean, really sing, and he was really good. And his life in the military got significantly better after that. He became a featured performer in the Air Force music program, whether it was singing as a soloist or a piano accompanist or the lead in an opera like La Boheme or Pagliacci. He and Julia moved around a bit as they expanded their young family. Leslie was born in Sacramento, California in 1953. Mark in San Antonio in 1954. Karen in Germany in 1954. 58, Sean in Germany in 1963. Uh, and then finally, Christopher or Kirk came along in 1965, also in Germany. They moved back to the US and landed at Fort Meade, first living in Garrity Crossing and then in Waterbury Heights in Crownsville, which would become the family home for 30 years until he moved into assisted living. Albert loved being a dad to his kids and worked so hard to support them and make them proud. He also was thrilled to have the privilege of being grandpa to Jordan, Maya, Jenna, Miles, Griffin, Tatum, and Colleen. Julia loved to travel and went on regular trips to St. Thomas or the other islands, mostly with her girlfriends. Sometimes Alfred would go too. They did purchase a timeshare in Cancun and enjoyed traveling there with some of their kids in the 1980s, especially. I think you all got to go there and enjoy that as well. In addition to his work with the Air Force, he also began moonlighting at a furniture store, a scam, and uh, did that to make help make ends meet for the family. After retiring from the Air Force as a GS-15, he would go on to hold several other significant jobs with the government, working for the 
Equal Opp Employment Opportunity Commission, the Civil Rights Commission, and the Library of Congress, where he got to take everybody's complaints on hold. What a fun job that must have been. He finally retired for good in the, the late 1990s, which allowed him more time to be a caregiver to his wife, Julia, who suffered for many years with a heart condition and before passing away in 1999. Alfred bore all of his life's losses with grace and with strength. Not just Julia's death, but also the early passing of a first wife, Faith, and two of his own children, who preceded him in death, William and Russell. By this point in the late 1990s, Alfred had also become part of the music ministry here at our church, and what a gift that was. After raising his own family at Our Lady of the Fields in Crownsville and connecting with some other music programs at uh, other various churches along the way, he finally found a place here and he made his presence known. He became a regular in the choir and featured soloist on many, many occasions. He loved to sing everything from Handel to Bach, so the classical hymns of faith, as well as the songs out of the spiritual tradition, but he always made it clear that he didn't want to be pigeonholed as a singer just out of that genre. He was a classically trained singer, and he was proud of all that he had worked for and all that he had achieved along the way. He was forced to be a pioneer of sorts. He didn't choose that, but that was what life allotted him, and he was really proud of what he'd been able to quietly achieve along the way. He was still singing with the choir here in 2014 when I arrived at the church, and he continued to do so for as long as he could shuffle his way up to the choir loft. And uh, the choir loved having him still be present and to be part of that, even as his memory was failing. Alfred got to spend the last several years here at the Heartlands, just across the parking lot from the church. One of my one of my uh, last memories of um, Alfred actually was not this past Christmas, we weren't able to do that, but the Christmas before, we had families from our church going over to the Heartlands, and uh, they were they were doing crafts with some of the residents, and they were singing songs, and, and I remember him singing that day, and singing with the kids, and sitting there doing these little silly crafts, and just smiling, and just grinning ear to ear, and, and just be, and just being so polite to me, whether he knew who I was at that point or not, I'm not sure. But it was just, he was kind and gentle to the end. I came across a quote uh, this week that made me think of your dad and your grandfather. Uh, Antoine Saint Exupere, who was famous for writing uh, uh, The Little Prince, he'd also been a pilot in World War II. And he knew the loss of friends, and, and he wrote eloquently about that. He, he talked about the, uh, how difficult it is to lose somebody that you can get really close to. And it made me think of what it's like to say goodbye to a father or a grandfather. And so these are his words. Bit by bit, it comes over us that we shall never again hear the laughter of our friend or father or grandfather, that this one garden is forever locked against us. And at that moment begins our true mourning, which though it may not be rending, is yet a little bitter. For nothing in truth can replace that companion, old friends, cannot be created out of hand. Nothing can match the treasure of common memories of trials endured together, of quarrels, reconciliations, of generous emotions. It is idle having planted an acorn in the morning to expect that afternoon to sit in the shade of an oak. So life goes on. For years we plant the seed, we feel ourselves rich, and then come other years when time does its work and our plantation is made sparse and thin, only one by one, our comrades slip away in the privacy of their shade. We are deprived now of the shade from this great oak that left its mark in the world and certainly on your lives as well. But we are also left with these memories of the, of the trials endured together, the common uh, reconciliations and generous emotions that he speaks about. And we will remember that voice always remember that voice. And I think Alfred felt most alive and most an instrument of God when he was raising his voice in song, whether it be whether it be some show tune or whether it be an aria or whether it be a hymn of the church or whether it be part of an opera. He just loved to sing and he felt like that was a gift that he could offer. I know he offered you all many more gifts as well. We're gonna hear one of his songs and then we'll turn it over to you to share and fill in the story some more 
um, tell us a little bit more and we'll include you in that as well, Mark.
Hello, everyone. I'm Karen. Um, I'm not going to say too much, except that my father was exceptional. He also, when he retired, not everyone knows this, but he took on raising my infant daughter when she was three months old. And my father loved to tell everyone that he had her from three months to 19 months. He knew those numbers for a very long time. He was so proud of that. And every day I would go to work. My husband and I would go to work. He'd come over every day to our house and babysit our daughter, except no money. And the thing that was funny about him coming each day was back in those days, um, you, if you wanted to tape something so you could watch it later, at least this is what I thought, you left the TV on, you had to leave the TV on. So the only show that I tape every day and still to this day is The Young and the Restless. So one day my father, and this was on all the time, every day, he, he just would leave it on, he never said a word. Finally one day he said, tell me a little bit more about Victor Newman. <laughs> And he was hooked from then on. So that, that's a funny little thing that I remember about him. The other thing about my dad is that he really could have cared less about actual food. He wanted to get right to the dessert. It was just in the way to get to that. And um, in the last few years of his life, I would take him to see Sean, our, my autistic brother, his autistic son, we would go once a month. And our outing was to pick Sean up, <clears throat> excuse me, drive through McDonald's. And he was always amazed about the drive through. We had a lot of discussion about that. Like, how do they know? What are the two windows for? Like, we had to talk about that a little bit. But we would always, I would always get him cookies for him. He'd always first say, no, no, I don't want them. Then he would eat a cookie and put the bag and wrap it all up to save them for later. And then he would eventually eat every cookie. But we had to have a discussion each time, like, I don't want the cookies. <laughs> it was like, you're going to eat the cookies, so just take them. So it was just kind of a fun little outing that we had. And it was very um, special to us because it was something that we shared every month. And it was, um, it was just, he was just such a remarkable dad. And even when I was younger, much younger, he would take me out on outings and we'd go to DC and get ice cream or pizza or something like that. Um, he was just always there for me. And there was um, a very um, deep love between the two of us. And I just wanted to share those few things with you. I can't thank you enough for, for Zooming and being here. I will also say this, and then I'll, I will let uh, my brother come up. Heartland at Severna Park meant the absolute world to him. Excuse me. Um, he loved it. He loved every minute of it. He loved the desserts. He was their marketing guru <laughs> because of the desserts. So anytime anybody came in there, he was the man to say, oh, let me tell you about Heartlands. They took such good care of him. I'm indebted to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this thing on? So, Maya. Hi, Uncle Kirk. <laughs> Alfred McEwen, 1929 to 2021. It's a good run for a black dude. I'm gonna tell you what, he came along when it was rough. He could have taken the easy way out. He could have been a porter on a train or something. But 
his father died when he was a kid. All he wanted to do was be a father. And he was a great father. He loved watching nature shows. He never watched a sport in his life. He never watched football, baseball, basketball, ever. He sang opera, sang like a bird. He gave us the family vocation, our voice. My sister can sing. She sang in a band for a little bit, Backstreets or whatever it was called. My brother was a disc jockey. And then on television, great voice, loved by country music artists and rock and rollers alike. I make my money because of my voice. I'm on the radio and I sang my late sister Leslie sang at the Met in New York and taught kids out in Washington. We got that from Alfred. Pop, Pop, Bert, Uncle Al, Colonel, call him what you want. This isn't a pity party, it's a celebration. He had a great life. My dad, uh, he could have sang all over the world and he did with the military. As Reverend Ron said, Duke Ellington saw him, asked him to come with him, but my father wanted to finish up his education first and have a family and that's what he did. He didn't want to go on the road and, uh, and miss out on six kids. But you look at what he's done, a Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force, a GS-15 in the government, Director of Complaints of the Library of Congress, he also was a seasonal worker at Macy's after he retired. He'd go and play crossword puzzles at McDonald's in Crofton and brag about all of his kids until my brother got on CBS and then he got the lion's share of it. But uh, I just remember my, my father, when I got a job at 98 Rock and he, uh, I had to change my name because Chris Emery had the name Chris. He wanted me to be Tolly, which was my middle name, Talbert. I was like, that's not gonna work, Bert. <laughs> But there were so many Stones albums in that we played albums back in the day. There must have been 23, 25 albums. And I said, I can't find some of these songs. And he said, you need to get in there earlier and grab the Stones albums and look at them and find the songs. He said, he said, being a black guy in rock and roll, you got to work harder, man. He said, when you go in for an interview, and the guy sitting across the desk is a white guy, it might be easier for him to hire the white guy if you make it easier. But if you work harder, he can't, you, he can't not hire you. That's what my father instilled in me. Some things I'm gonna miss. Him telling me about vitamins. That dude ate vitamins, and he would tell you, if you got a cold coming on, take two vitamin C, take some vitamin E, put some uh, lead in your pencil, you want to take zinc? I mean, he and he would tell you that the doctors told him the reason why he looked so good at 90 is because he ate vitamins. Confident. That dude was confident. You think I lack confidence? I don't because of him. He'd come home every night, eat a spoon of peanut butter straight out of the jar. Boom, grab a big old spoon of peanut butter. Turn me on the cold duck. He'd come home, bring cold duck, pour me a little glass when I was like nine years old. I was like, thanks, Bert. He would tell me that, you know, you're not our kid, right? Yeah, Mark, you're, Farmer Jones is coming. Isn't the farmer coming to get you? And I'm like, no, no, really? <laughs> like, oh, man. Farmer, you're my kid. Look, you've got the McEwen thumb. Look at your thumb. The McEwen thumb. Whoever says anything like that? <laughs> oink, oink. After when he's getting older and he'd finish eating, oink, oink is what he would say at the end. He was a great father, sweet man till the end, president of CSAC, which was community services for uh, autistic adults and children. I have a brother, Sean, who's autistic, and he felt better when he's, after he saw Sean, he's like, I can rest. I saw Sean. What a tough gig. God doesn't give you more than you can handle. You know, I had to grow up with people looking at us because we had an autistic, you know, brother walking through Burger King going, whoo, 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 whoo. But, but we could handle it. That's why God gave it to us. So anyway, uh, my father had it together until about 2012 or so, and then the light started to dim a little bit. He'd forget appointments that we would make. Uh, he'd have strong four or five stories he could tell people like, man, your dad's so great, but if you stayed with him long enough, you're gonna get those stories on a loop. And then they started to go even further, but he did his job and then some, he had a great sense of humor. He was a, a mimic as Reverend Ron said, I miss him already, I'm glad I knew him. I wish you guys knew him like I did. Alfred McEwen will live on through all of us forever. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right, Mark, we're gonna try to bring you into this and um, I'm gonna turn you around so they can see you. 
I'm going to put you on uh, speaker view here so they see just you. All right, and we'll see if we can make this work. Let's see. All right, all yours. There's Tatum and Maya and Vicky, and uh, uh, I get to follow my brother. <laughs> oh man, a week ago today. The phone rang, my cell phone rang at 6.32 in the morning. It was from my sister, Karen. And when you have a father who's 92 and fading fast, you have a premonition. And I was right. Uh, Karen was just sobbing. Dad was gone. Um, I'm 66. I had my father... We had my father a long time. There are people who both their parents were gone a while ago and ours weren't. Um, my father, um, my sons, Miles and Griffin, knew him as Pop Pop. Maya knew him as Pop Pop. Uh, Tatum knew him as Pop Pop. Um, uh, Jordan knew him as Pop Pop. Um, you know, he was a great father, great grandfather. Um, he, we were lucky. Lucky in that we were taught and raised differently. And when you talk about my father, you have to talk about my mother. They were a great team. And they would teach us manners and being polite and uh, um just being uh, thankful, thank you, and uh, um, all kinds of things. I always say he prepared us for the world outside that window. And for that, I am eternally grateful to him. Um, <laughs> Chris didn't tell his story, I'll tell him. Um, my dad's name was Alfred. He got a, a mail delivered to the house that said Albert McKeown. And Chris Kirk thought it was the funniest thing. He would call him Bert all the time. They went to Cancun, Mexico uh, on a vacation. And uh, Kirk uh, said to my dad, hey, Bert. And a guy next to my dad said, you know, I would let my kids call me by my name. And my dad said, that's not my name. <laughs> That's not my name. <laughs> great story, great story. But um, uh, I, I called my dad a lot. But towards the end, in the last six months, I called him just about every day. And uh, you could see him getting weaker and weaker. Uh, Alzheimer's, I wouldn't wish Alzheimer's on anyone. But you learned, I learned, when you talk to him, you had to come with something. He couldn't ask him things like, how'd you meet mom? Because he couldn't remember. So as the time got closer and closer to this, the conversations got shorter and shorter. And it was mainly me telling him how much I loved him and telling him over and over, I am who well, I am because of you. And um, I love him dearly. Uh, um, I, I, I just, I feel so lucky to have him in my life, my mom in my life. And um, I miss him every second of every day. And Dad, I love you very much. And thank you. Thank you all for coming. And thank you for sharing those memories with us, too. Uh, yeah, it was sinking home here, you could tell, just by looking at the eyes. Thank you. Anybody else who wanted to speak? I, I know, I knew the two of you did, but anybody else who wanted to speak? You know, you can say something later if you want. I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot. Don't want to turn. All right.
Let us pray. Our eternal God, you've shared with us the life of Alfred McEwen. Before he was ours, he is yours. For all that Alfred has given us to make us what we are as a dad, as a grandfather, as a friend, for that of him which lives and grows in each of us, for his life that in your love will never end, we give you thanks. As now we offer him back into your arms, we pray for comfort in our loneliness, strength in our weakness, and courage to face the future unafraid. Oh God, draw those of us who remain in this life closer to one another. Make us faithful to serve each other. And give us to know the peace and the joy which is life in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn today, one that your dad loved and speaks to this moment, it is well with my soul. We are able to say it is well with my soul because God is with us through it all, even this day and every day.
Again, let me thank all of you for coming to be part of the service, either virtually or in person, to celebrate Alfred's life today. If any of you would like a copy of the bulletin that we've created for today's service, we'll be happy to get you a PDF or send you a hard copy, and you all as family and we'll give you as many copies as you need. Now go forth this day, and may God go with you, above you to inspire you, beneath you to undergird you, in front of you to lead you, behind you to encourage you, and within you to give you grace and strength and peace, so that you might be able to say, in life and in death, it is well with my soul. Amen. Thank you.